podcast. I'm grateful to be in recovery. I'm Dr. Felice Cellini, and this is our Sunday morning Why Wait for Recovery Sorry. community oh, meeting. Sorry. Hi, okay, good. we don't have ourselves together. Yeah, we yet. do. Go. Hi, good morning. My name is Heidi, and I'm blessed and grateful to be in recovery. Um, I'm a little all over the place today, so I'm just saying that to get centered. So, I am an emotional eater, I'm a compulsive overeater, I'm a binger, I'm a purger. I am a food addict and a drug addict in recovery. And I'm a drug addict, alcoholic, anorexic in recovery. Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. Not in this room because it's monsooning in Florida. So nobody came to this room actually. So and I hope everybody out there in South Florida is safe and dry. Absolutely. I mean, we made it in our boats. <laughs> yes, we did. We rode here. So Because that's what we're willing to do for our recovery. Right. Bam. So, <laughs> actually, yesterday we had a workshop, which was phenomenal. Amazing. I mean, we are just learning so much, and the people in it, and it's just really special. It's very different, and it's exceptionally special. And one of the topics that came up was boundaries, and it seems to be a challenge. I know it's a challenge for me. So it's a challenge for me as well. And I have my challenge with boundaries is, is really what's the difference between acceptance and boundaries? So what is it accept? What, what, what behavior from somebody else is acceptable for me to be able to look at somebody and say, well, okay, they're going through their own thing and this is how they are right now. And I can accept that as opposed to, well, this behavior is unacceptable and that's a boundary of mine and you can't cross over that boundary. So I had an incident on Friday night. Okay, let's talk about the incident. So let's just say a friend arrived at my house <laughs> at 11 o'clock at night with okay. a whole lot of their friends and two kittens and <laughs> arrives and says, you're looking after my cats for me. I'm going out and I'm going, no, I'm not because firstly, you don't arrive to say hello to me at 11 o'clock at night. And then I walk into the garage and there's a huge bong. And for me, I am a marijuana addict. I mean, I'm, I'm a garbage pail drug addict. I mean, I will take anything when I was using, but really marijuana was my drug of choice. And it's been, and I told them before, you know, I don't want to be around it. It's a matter of respect. Um, so, you know, there's certain things, because I love this person, I'm kind of stuck in a quandary. So, so, so as far as being stuck in a quandary, so this is just, um, this is a boundary, definitely. This is an acceptance. Um, this is definitely a boundary. And so the pot in the house is completely unacceptable. A and if you're gonna put yourself in that position to say, if there's pot in my house, I'm calling the cops. And that's the way that it's gonna play out from now on. I mean, like that would have to be like your, um, your tough love thing with the person that you're talking about. And as far as knocking at the door at 11 o'clock at night, if somebody knocks at the door and you look out and it's somebody that's not supposed to be here at 9 o'clock at night, you don't need to answer the door. Well, they're that close that they've actually got access to my house. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, so so everybody everybody knows just walk in. Yeah. So they just basically put in a code and walk in. But, you know, that's also part of the challenge today is um, pot is so widely acceptable. If I had to phone the police up and say, listen, I've got pot in my house, come here, they'd laugh at me. I mean, that, that's, that's a challenge. Um, for me, it's a problem, though. Yeah, so, that, so it's about sitting down with this person and um, letting this person know what is and what isn't acceptable um, and, and taking it from there. And really sitting down, not when you're angry, having a conversation with him when you're not angry and um, letting him know what behavior is is unacceptable. You know, the thing with the boundary is that people are gonna show up the way that they show up, right? We talked about boundaries yesterday. If, you know, there are um, there are people that, that somebody shows up to their house, do the whole pot thing, whatever, and then an, an hour later, you're giving them their credit card so they could go buy, you know, clothes. So that, of course, would be, would be unacceptable behavior from your part, right? because then you're saying, well, your behavior is okay. So as far as that goes, it's kind of, a, kind of a different thing where you would actually need to sit down with this person and tell this person, this behavior is unacceptable and change your friggin' code to your house if you need to. So part of the challenge though, and this is where it leads into the acceptance, is there's an element of fear. And the fear is that the person's not gonna wanna come back. Mm -hmm. And that is the part where I struggle with acceptance is making that decision that, listen, this is a hardcore boundary, but the consequences are, might, they might not be what I want or what I like, or 
and they you know it's very fear-based so the acceptance in that is a really difficult part for me to actually work around yeah yeah it is and so it's like if you were and I'm gonna put this out there if you are in a relationship with somebody who's abusive and you love the person when you met them right and now they come home one night and they beat the shit out of you and then after they're sorry that they beat you up this is easier to see it's an easier right. visual that's why I'm going there and this was a person that you were in love with and they beat you up right you're gonna let them back in you know yeah I believe that first time shame on you second time shame on me so even though yes if you tell this person I'm gonna call the cops if you beat me up you might not see that person again but what kind of relationship do you want to is it is it worth having a relationship that's kind of abusive than losing the relationship and remember, you guys, everything that's happening is happening for just now. Can you try to reconnect us, please, Ange? Everything is happening for just this minute. So just because I get angry with you and I don't come back to see you this week doesn't mean I'm never going to come back to see you. Isn't that interesting, though? We, we can set boundaries with other people, but not with ourselves. So we'll come home, we'll beat ourselves up, mm -hmm. beat the crap out of ourselves and keep doing the same thing. So when I was in active addiction, I would have stayed with a person who was really abusive because I did. Uh, I mean, of course. <laughs> I didn't see them and I was that crazy that I was with crazy people. Um, but that craziness stayed inside my head and I still became, I still that abusive person to myself. I still the bully to myself. Um, so really I think that being able to, when I sit in recovery, I see things a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. You know, I see how far I've come down the road in terms of my thinking. It still doesn't change challenges that I face because I'm still, I still am essentially the same essential person underneath. I still care about certain things. And of course you do. I have certain values. And, you, and you're still going to have certain fears. And right. so yesterday at workshop, you said something very important. And remember, we do act a lot differently when we're in active addiction. And somebody had said, um, I don't remember what was said, but the thing is, is that when we're in active addiction, everybody around us is sick. So, right, everybody is dealing with an addict. I always say that, you know, why do people stay with addicts who are in active addiction? Like, what's their problem, right? Their problem is that they're part of the play, right? So before when you're in active addiction and you're acting a certain way and everybody's playing their part, that's the way it is. Then you upset the apple cart by getting well. Now you get well, and everybody else is still used to playing their part and so I, I, and you're not that person anymore you're not the person that that allows the abuse or you know I, I'll, you could do anything you want just leave me alone so I could stay in my room isolate and get high oh I remember the conversation the conversation started with me saying that when I had bariatric surgery I couldn't eat the way that I used to eat and do the things that I used to do. And I stepped into recovery and everything changed for me. And mm -hmm. I expected people around me mm -hmm. to also change because I was changing and I had changed, but they don't. Right, exactly. And so that's why I said, so if you read any book about addiction, they're gonna talk about the role that everybody in the family plays around the addict. We're a member of community. And so everybody has their part in the community. Now you're changing. And everybody else isn't just going to step in line because you're changing. Everyone isn't going to wake up one day and say, mom or my wife or whatever has changed. So now I'm going to be a respectful, kind and compassionate person because that's what she's working on. Right? Yeah. Because you're not what they're used to now either. Right. And for some of us, we choose our spouses and our partners when we're in active addiction. Duh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so all of a sudden that, that shift in paradigm is huge. Yeah. It definitely is. You know, that's why I think I also say don't make any huge decisions in the first year of recovery. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and they say that for a couple of different reasons. And one of them is that, you know, you have to see how the rest of the world is falling into place while you're working on yourself. And you will pay attention to what you need to change in yourself as opposed to getting um, caught up with the chaos that's going on around you. Because remember, once I get caught up with the chaos that's going on around me, that's like being an active addiction. Now I don't have to look at myself. So it's a lot of work, you guys. And it is a lot of work. And right? it's also a lot of learning and unlearning. Yeah, right. Uh, the unlearning part, I think, is harder than the learning part. Um, Laura, I'm going to reach out to you. Good morning. Unmute yourself, hon. Yeah, good morning. Yeah, and so we talked about that, too. And we talked yeah. about... Um, 
yesterday at workshop and and we talked about you know what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior and how do we respond um, and our codependency issues you know I don't want this person to not like me I don't want this person to to not want to hang out with me I don't want you know this is what I want and so I'm gonna to go to any length to get what I want just like we did with our drugs by the way I'm gonna to go to any length to get what I want even if that means disrespecting myself right right and so we're gonna learn not to disrespect ourselves and we're gonna learn that everybody else is gonna to need to learn not to disrespect me as well or I'm gonna spend my time doing something else yes. you know it's really really it's hard and it's harsh but at some point we need to say no I'm not this doormat and this is who I'm growing up to be and I love you and I care about you and if you want to have this type of relationship with me I need it for, for it to be I will respect you and you will respect me mm -hmm. right because we don't walk around feeling like shit well yes yeah, sometimes we do but you know not all the time like we want different things and we're we're learning um, that if we give respect it's okay to demand respect back demand I mean by I don't need to have this type of relationship with you if you're not going to be respectful to me respect is part of love you guys you know, it also what you're saying raises like a couple of things. One is to set that boundary. I'm so used to the F you dance. Like when I try to set a boundary, it becomes like it was always that screaming match and that fight that when you've done this and you haven't done this and what have you done for me lately kind of dance. Mm -hmm. um, so really establishing boundaries doesn't have to be a mean or a hostile kind of thing. It can just be done as I'm learning from you in a way that's really calm and succinct because I'm learning how to speak clearly before I used to dance around in circles not really speaking honestly or speaking my truth because that was the way that I operated because I was so scared of not being liked. right and so your life was chaotic and so we're gonna learn to let let go of the chaos to just allow somebody to hear what I'm saying remember you guys don't tell me what I did tell me how you feel right so Laura, you and I are having a conversation and you get mad at me or I get mad at you and I hang up on you. Right. And you call me back and you say, I can't believe you hung up on me. Well, I can because I just hung up on you. So I can believe it, right? When you say, hey, Felice, when you hang up on me, it makes me feel like you don't care about me and it makes me feel disrespected. So if we're gonna have this friendship, when we speak with each other, if you're angry, tell me you're angry. But don't yep. hang up because this is how it makes me feel yep. completely different conversation than I can't believe you did this why yes. do people do that uh, of course you can believe I did it I just did it like what's there not to believe <laughs> because I get very indignant and self-righteous like how dare you I mean how dare you hang up don't you know who I am well and beside that but whenever we get indignant you guys it's because we feel like crap about ourselves right that's what indignant is it's you know, we think we're saying, well, I'm better than that. Like, how could you treat me like that? But what we're really saying is, I feel like crap when you treat me like that. Yep. And it makes me feel unloved and disrespected. And that's really what we mean. But God forbid we should say how we feel and say, hey, when this happens, I'm scared. Or when this happens, it makes me sad. Or when this happens, I feel disconnected from you. And you're somebody that I love and I don't want to have that disconnect. Can we work on, on changing this? Right. You know, you also mentioned the boundaries thing. And I think with the food, it's really insidious because we always started, we'll do that diet on Monday. So we said things like, I'm not having this today. And we end up having this today. So we've already established something that we've broken. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes, so the boundary for me became that whole play between willpower. And then it starts that whole cycle of justification and the shame and the guilt and the whole thing. So boundaries in terms of clarity is something that I'm still learning what they look like and how to express them because I've forgotten for so long. Right, mm -hmm. and, and again, what is acceptable behavior? And we said this yesterday. So, it, it, you know, to understand that your kid's a teenager and that he's gonna act like a teenager and that maybe he's gonna show up or your daughter or whatever, maybe they're gonna show up at 11 o'clock at night that's that's to say I understand is different than saying and I'm gonna allow it to happen in my house 
Right. And I think part of this came with the messy room. Okay, the messy room. <laughs> uh -oh, and we're gonna teenagers. go back to the messy room again. <laughs> right, because that's a, for me that's a really difficult boundary. So when you've got a fifteen year old, you can't tell them you're leaving the house. Okay, <laughs> if you're gonna make the house messy, you're not gonna be staying here anymore. It's a really difficult. No, thing. but it's not difficult to say the twenty bucks that you want to go to the mall later. I'm not giving you until your room's cleaned up. That's all. It's like their job. They go to school, they get good grades, and they clean their room, and they're respectful. That's their whole entire job, besides figuring out the whole entire world around them, which is a really big job for them. But the, the job that they have at home should be pretty simple. And that's simply, if I'm going to be loving and kind to you, I'm going to expect loving and kindness back. What can I withhold? Well, I'm not going to withhold my love because you're my kid, but I'm definitely withholding my credit card. Definitely. I'm going to I'm going to reward you after you go tell me I I'm not going to say who this is, but I had somebody very close to me who had a 16-year-old who when the 16-year-old would tell his mother to go F herself. And then it would be like, "Okay, I want to go play hockey. Well, here's my credit card because it's going to cost $80." How does that happen? That's our fault, right? right. Not the kids' fault. We have uh, the the kids absolutely know that listen. It's like, I'm gonna call, I, I'm not gonna show up to work today. I'm not gonna call in sick and I'm not gonna show up and, and my boss is still gonna pay me, right? My boss is still gonna pay me, e even though I didn't call and I didn't go to work. I, I mean, that doesn't because happen. Because you're so fabulous. Exactly, because <laughs> yeah. I deserve it. Right, right exactly. Yeah, that don't happen in the real world. And actually we're teaching when it's our children, we're teaching them behavior that doesn't really work in the real world. Well, it also depends how manipulative your kids are. And if you've got, my kids were very interesting though. They always had access to their own money that they got from their grandparents. You know, I think it also becomes like certain things. It depends on a personality. Because some people, as if... I'm going to tell you she's making excuses right now. Go ahead. I am. And I was an addict. <laughs> Remember yes, something? I was in an active addiction for most of my life raising my kids. My kids grew up, I grew up with an addict. Um, so all of a sudden, trying to establish boundaries when they're older and they're 15, 17 years old is really a difficult thing to do because... But I've been in the car with you. I've been in the car with you where you're all mad and then somebody says, Ma, I need 20 bucks to go to the mall. And you give them the 20 bucks. I've seen it with my very own eyes. And then I like to write <laughs> Exactly. So that's the part that we want to let go of. That we want to say, hey... You, I understand that you need 20 bucks. I need for you to understand that I need for you to clean your room. And so let's make that a, an equal equal. You clean your room, I give you 20 bucks. It's a win-win. You have a choice. You don't need to clean your room just like I don't need to give you 20 bucks. There we go. So you be kind to clean your room, I'll be kind to give you 20 bucks. That'll be our exchange. It's really not that hard. The thing is, you know, we said this yesterday, we enable people because it makes our lives easier because we don't want to deal with them being hysterical, which by the way, you don't need to deal with somebody being hysterical. It's okay, puppy. You don't need to deal with somebody being hysterical. If they're hysterical, it's okay to walk away. Um, but but it's, it's about just approaching things. You know, it, it's okay to say, hey, you know, when your room's a mess, it makes me kind of angry. And I don't feel like being angry. And I know that you want to go to the mall. And I know you don't want to be angry. So go clean your room. I'll give you money. And neither one of us will be angry. Not with the, Mom, if you, I can't believe it. And then you say, well, da, 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 da. and if you would do this, da, 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 da. right? And then everybody's dancing. Well, I'm just smiling because <laughs> I would go through that whole dance and yes, then punish them and forget why I punished them. Right. And then the next day, give them the 20 bucks. I'll, again, <laughs> I've seen it happen with my very own eyes. So it's not even like she, I, you can lie, but I've you been know, there. And I think part of it is showing up in the way, you know, I grew up with these preconceptions of the perfect mother, the perfect wife, the perfect crap, okay? And that, so all of a sudden I step into these roles without thinking about my core values. Like what are the things that I really want to install in my kids? And I was having a conversation with a friend of mine and she was saying, all she really wants is for her kids to be passionate about what they're doing. And I'm thinking, you know, I stepped so far away from that while I was in my chaos that I was more focused in what they were doing and how they were doing it and how they were showing up rather than them as 
keep on you know those core values it was more about looking good than really feeling great about ourselves yeah um and you guys when when we let them know that it's not okay for them to be disrespectful to us we're really teaching them how to approach the world you know that it, that's not going to be a, a risk, that that's not going to be okay anywhere in the real world it's not um and and we've raised these children however we've raised these children and there's a whole lot whole lot more enabling going on right now i think for some reason i think it's different because moms and dads are both working it's not like you're home taking care of your kids you know, we're we also so we start disconnected when yeah. we are at home we are on our electronic stuff so we just really are totally totally disconnected um yeah i agree with you yeah so so again we can set those boundaries and make sure you guys when you are setting a boundary with anyone you're letting them know how you feel why you're setting the boundary how you're feeling and that this is the way that it's going to be and don't ever do it angry or yelling or because the louder you scream the less i listen i think you said something to me about you can't be coming from a place of love when you're angry right right so that always sits with me yeah so um hi you want to check in maybe later okay um and you want to check in hun no <laughs> okay nobody wants to check in Karen? it's raining We'll go up here. Hi, Karen. Good morning. How are you? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm good. You know, I get caught in so many fears and worries for nothing. And when I let that wall down, I had a fabulous time last night, but I had so many worries and fears <laughs> yes, going into did. it <clears throat> that I just almost, you know, I almost jinxed myself. So it, it but it was really fun that that's awesome and yeah and you were like when we talked about you going to the concert you're like oh you really didn't want to go and you were just going because it was the right thing to do and yeah then you went and had a fabulous time so isn't but it great you had to have that conversation with yourself all day about what a crap time oh. you're gonna have so that's where you lived all day well it was weeks oh several weeks what, well i <laughs> underestimated <laughs> Yeah, and so for weeks you worried about something that never happened anyway. And as a matter of fact, imagine if for weeks you were saying, I'm going to this concert, it's going to be so much fun. I haven't gone to a concert in so long. I'm going to this concert, it's going to be so great. Oh my God, I love the music. It's going to be so amazing. It's a night out. I'm getting to spend time with my hubby, right? And you know, who doesn't love Jimmy Buffett? And um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and having that attitude, so instead of having the stomach ache and the uh-oh and coming from a place of lack, you would have come from a place of abundance. And the same exact, at the end of the day, at 5 o'clock, it was 5 o'clock, right? Somewhere. You just, <laughs> yeah. no, no, but but you know what I mean. Right, the, the only right, difference right, right. was your, your, how you were spiritually, mm -hmm. how you allowed yourself to be spiritually. Um, and it was the, the best thing that we could have done together. Um, it just, it was really wonderful. That's and so, you know, we could have gone to watch, you know, paint dry and it would have been just nice to be together and to be out. And uh, so it, it really was, it worked out really well. Right. And so again, those were the things that you could have been focusing on. Well, I'm going to spend some time with my hubby and we're going to be out doing something together and it'll allow us to connect without the dog, right? And the puppy in the middle <laughs> of us. And, and, you know, he deserves this and it's his birthday and I'm giving a, you know, a, the gift of yeah. my time and of yeah. acceptance. And a, so all of those things could have been going through your head instead of the things that were going through your head. Isn't that so amazing? I know. Isn't it amazing? That we choose that? We choose that. You know, I think also um, when we're in active addiction, we are so busy all the time. There's like so much chaos and there's so much to think about Everywhere. that all of a sudden <laughs> stepping out of it and having that quiet time becomes a thing to learn. It's not something because, I, and it depends how long you've been using for. I used up until for so many years that it became like my default behavior. So being quiet and just going with the moment and also being able to express ourselves honestly is just something that's a whole learning process. And, and, and had I known, um, you know, a great thing to do when you think like something like that, I'm going to go to this concert and I don't want to go, right? A great thing to do is every single day beside your regular gratitude list, 
write three things that you're grateful for, that has to do with that. I'm grateful yeah, that my neighbor true. gave me Very tickets, helpful. or I'm grateful that I could afford the tickets, and I'm grateful that yeah. I have a car to get there in, and I'm grateful that I know every word to every song. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like stuff <laughs> like that so that you can actually switch and see the positive yeah. as opposed to seeing fear. What's fear? I'm afraid of not getting what I want or losing what I have. I'm afraid of, I, I'm not going to get what I want. I'm not going to have a good time. I'm not going to uh, be able to connect. I'm, um, it's going to go poorly. All those things are afraid of not getting what I want or losing what I have. Right. right. And I was worried about, A, the disconnect between my husband and myself, which we, it's me, it's not him. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we connected. And the fact that the puppy was having some health issues or some eating issues that I was worried about. So once I, once I let go of that and thought, she's fine and we're having a great time, it was, it was awesome. Yeah, I'm really glad for you. I'm glad. Yeah, and, and, and understanding that and speaking about it, um, my hope for you is that so the next time something comes up, you'll be able to, to put into perspective what's going to be good about it or what's going to be scary, but it's going to be a learning experience, right? What, what positives am I going to get out of the situation no matter what? Yeah. You know, and I think also um, that realization that our heads sometimes lie to us, you know, um, those crazy thoughts are crazy thoughts and just putting them out there. You know, we've also got a community. We've got our What's Eating You community. We've got people that we can call, people we can text. And sometimes just vocalizing those takes the power out of whatever those thoughts are, just saying it out loud or putting it down and sharing it just really removes it out of our head. Um, so we change that track. I always think of the old record players, I'm old, you know, and you'd have the needle in the mm -hmm. groove and we get stuck get in the stuck. groove and just keep going round and keep going round. Yeah. And I think that actually helps shift it as well. And then you'll get some good You're suggestions right. out there too. So, cause there are people that right. can help you with that as well. And then you'll have us that are really nosy and want to know how was the concert, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Viewer question. Viewer question. Christian, We're gonna get to you, Laura. Christian says, what are your thoughts on intuitive eating and mindful eating? So I don't know what that means. I'm not kidding. Hi, Christian. I, I don't Kristen. know. Kristen, sorry. I'm not sure if you could be a little bit more specific about intuitive eating because I intuitively ate Percocet. So I'm not kidding. Like, I, like my brain was telling me that the more opiate I ate, the better I was going to feel. When, in fact, the more opiate I ate, the better I felt. <laughs> so, and so, so you don't. And, and I'm not goofing, mm. actually, because <laughs> when I'm an active addiction, I don't have any good intuition, right? All of my best thinking, they say in the rooms, all of my best thinking got, got me to where I was. So I'm not sure if we're talking about when I'm in active addiction and I want to change or when I am, you know, there are some people, I know that in the beginning we do meal planning and all of that, right? And then there are some people that don't do their meal planning. They just know I'm going to eat kind of this amount of calories and I'm going to eat chicken and broccoli and um, almonds today. You know what I mean? So I don't know what intuitive meaning okay. eating means. I would love to actually just say a little bit about this. So I'm the type of person, I'm the compulsive overeater. So I can reach a stage where I actually don't get full and I don't taste my food. I'm just sitting down and stuffing myself and stuffing myself and stuffing myself. So that's when I'm in active addiction. And part of having, when I went through the surgery, firstly, I couldn't do that because my stomach, I was incapable of doing it, was just really uncomfortable. And generally when I was using because that is using mm -hmm. um i would eat till i got so full and uncomfortable and i'd either purge and throw up so i could keep on eating or i'd just be really really uncomfortable so when the only part i get with intuitive eating is i turn my meals almost into a ceremony so i'll put things on a smaller plate i'll make things look pretty i'll sit and try focus on what i'm eating so that i'm mindful of the process and I also make really healthy choices. So now I've got now you're I not do, an active addiction. Right. So when right, I'm in recovery, recovery right. there's a certain amount, you know, recovery is like a whole part thing. It's a spiritual, it's a mental, it's a physical, and it's also the community for me. So that's a big picture. So when I'm treating myself well, and part of that mindfulness is looking after myself and self-care, which means making healthy choices, having 
knowing what my non-negotiables are because I've got certain foods that are absolutely non-negotiable for me and those are the starches for me are absolutely sugar. Um, yeah, and the sweets are absolutely, these are things I do not touch because I've done enough research to know where it takes me and where I land up. But I also go to that extra mile that I treat myself as my best friend. So when I do sit down and eat, it's an event for me. It's not just something that I'm grabbing and eating quickly because I did that for so long. And I also make sure that I've got things to take care of myself. So on those days when I know I'm really busy and I'm showing properties and I'm crazy busy at work, I pack the things that I need and take it with me so I'm able to look after myself and looking as part of that self-care is eating properly for me as a food addict. Right, so if you're talking about intuitive, like I wake up in the morning and I brush my teeth and I do that because I know that it's a habit that I have that's a great habit that I need to do to take care of myself mm -hmm. and I pack my food for the day so that you know this is something that I do to take care of myself, that's different. I'm just saying when we're in active addiction, we ain't got no intuition. You know, our best thinking keeps us exactly where we are. Did um, Christian respond to that so that I can answer the question better? Kristen, mm -hmm. respond. So Kristen, if you can um, give me another shout out, please, so that I understand what you mean. Just because by definition, mm -hmm. I don't know what you mean. And I think there's also a danger. And the danger comes when we start thinking intuitive um, eating or whatever, or intuitive thinking when you know at it, our, intu yeah, know. our intuition. Oh. Oh, okay, so how come you didn't say so? Because I was waiting for you to come. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse okay, me. so I think also there's the danger of when we go into intuition in our minds with the sick mind. We think that we can pick up and eat certain things if we have a little bit of it. And as an addict, that's lying. I mean, our minds start lying to us to keep us using, to keep us sick. Yeah, so that's what I was saying. So if we're in active addiction, we don't have intuition, right? right. Right. So we don't have it. We do, but our intuition tells us to use. And our intuition's off. Our picker is broken. Exactly. Right. Sorry about that. Ange? Um, no, you are just asking what is intuitive, but I think you just said it. Like, intuitive, mindful eating is you eat when you're full and stop when you're not. And if you're... Backward. You stop when you're full. Oh. Oops. Yes. Sorry. That's okay. But it's, I don't think you can have um, intuitive eating and addiction in the same sentence. You're either an addict or you're you were an overeater right and you have trouble gauging that um i'm full i'm not from time to time but if you're mindful or intuitive about it and you're aware then you're able to do it but so you're add, you're talking about the person that can go out on saturday night and have two drinks yeah so, so a normal person that would be the ins yeah okay so that person has that intuition right. that or even if i drink until i vomit i'm certainly not going to wake up in the morning and do it again right right so you're talking about somebody who doesn't have an addictive brain when you're talking about intuitive? Right. Thank you. Because I had no idea right. what it and, meant. And also, I just wanted to point out as well, there's that other side of the coin as well. When you're an anorexic, that intuition is stopping you from eating. Do you know what I'm saying? So we've, got that, we've got that pendulum because I've swung both sides of that pendulum. Um, also, um, Again, we need to remember that the addictive brain is a whole lot different than somebody else's brain. Our brain reacts differently. So there are certain things that we put into our, our brain. And once we trip that whatever's going on in our brain, we do have that uh, physical craving and mental obsession where it becomes what's important. It becomes what we want. And like you said, then there isn't any shut off switch, right? So it's... um. So I think that people who aren't food addicts or bingers or purgers or anorexics, I think they could eat intuitively. Right. And <laughs> if your life is balanced and you're doing everything that you need to do to keep yourself healthy, whatever that looks like, um, then I understand intuition. But I'm not at that stage. So um, I may never get the, to that the stage. Part though. of the danger there, I think, is you know we see a lot online. I've seen where people are post-bariatric surgery and they figure they're going to eat I don't know, 800 calories a day or whatever it is. And so they go to McDonald's and they hmm. eat the, the French fries, but they don't eat them all at one time. So let's say that's, I have no idea of how many calories that is. It's a lot. And um, so they'll eat that throughout the day and then maybe eat a half of a Big Mac and they'll eat li little portions throughout the day. So that's like the alcoholic saying, well, I'm just going to have a sip of tequila every 15 minutes as opposed to drinking the bottle right now it don't work because it's still going to flip that switch of the mental craving the physical obsession and again 
our brains don't know how to shut that off. Right, and that's not a fix. I mean, to have bariatric surgery, I and I went in to fix it. I thought that this would be a long-term fix that I went and I changed the switch and everything shifted. And it wasn't, it was just a physical change to deal with what I was going through because it was a lifesaver for me. But that was only one part of the bigger picture. It was this part. part, I still had to work on the mental, the spiritual, um, the community stuff, the reasons why I got to that stage. Because do you know what? My weight has fluctuated so much over the years. Ever since I was seven years old, I've been a serial dieter. So it's been the up, the down, and I've been beating myself up for even longer. So really, um, I don't think intuition is something that is something I'm able to deal with. And what you just said also is that it ain't about the food. It's not about the Percocet, you guys. It's not about the alcohol and the sex and the gambling. It's not about that. It's why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I hurting myself, waking up the next day, continuing to hurt myself, and looking for beautiful words and ways to get around that? Let's call it this, right? We're not gonna call it binging and purging. We're gonna say that I'm, or for an anorexic, I'm, um, for health reasons, I'm not eating today, you know, or for whatever. It's, we look at other ways to discuss what it is that's going on instead of saying, honesty, I'm an addict, I have a problem, and I'm willing to do whatever it is that somebody else tells me to do so that I can change, somebody else that, that I know has recovery, so that I can change the way, I could change my perspective so that I could change my actions because right now I'm just stuck. You know, at the end of the day, I'm not sitting on the sofa because I was happy. You know, <laughs> I didn't not. Come, no, I didn't come here, walk into recovery because my life, because I was fighting blossoms and my life was happy. I mean, I just wasn't at that stage. I went into having surgery, my life was falling apart. I was unhealthy, I was uncomfortable, I was miserable. I was living in a room in the dark wearing the same clothes over and over again and they were all black. Um, so for me, I was totally isolating and away from my family. Recovery and stepping into doing what I did was a life-saving event. It wasn't something that I want to go back to. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's the bottom line is I know what it looks like when I start using and I'm in active addiction and I know the misery and the depth of those that misery that I reach. That honestly, that having the choice of being happy and if I've got that opportunity, I have to change everything and it first starts with my thinking. You know, my intuitive thinking makes me ill and makes me sick and puts me back into active addiction because I look to feel good and do you know what, it's not about feeling good. Right, and you thought intuitively that since you weren't eating the stuff that you don't like to eat, you could just get high. Right, Intuitively, 100%. and intuitively uh, <laughs> I thought if I pissed off my husband and sent the whole family out. I could sit and binge out of my secret drawer and no one would know, okay, because you're not going to smell it on my breath. But you know what? I was miserable. Yeah. And I thought intuitively it was okay for me to eat the Percocet after seven years clean because after all, the dentist did write the prescription for it and I was in some pain. Intuitively, I also thought that it was okay to take 10 at a time instead of one every six hours. I don't know why that is. But intuitively, that's what my brain tells me once I put whatever that substance is into my body. So, so this we're comes, different. <laughs> we are. So this comes back to our topic of boundaries and acceptance. So my acceptance is that I'm an addict. Acceptance is when I put up my hand and I say I'm an addict and I identify myself as an addict, that is acceptance. The boundaries that I have are also with myself. It's not okay for me just to have boundaries with other people and say these are absolutely non-negotiable. For me, I choose to have boundaries with myself because that's what also keeps me in recovery. Right, and the things that are non-negotiable like using. Right, and right. putting ourselves in the middle of chaos and doing those things that we did before and having the same behaviors even though we're clean. And my right? only intuition in this whole thing is knowing that other people's opinions, I, I have to live the outcome and the results. So when other people give me their opinions and their thoughts, opinions are opinions. What works for them doesn't necessarily work for me. And I just need to know that it's absolutely a black and white because when I start going into that gray area is when the chaos starts stepping into my world. Yeah, when I start going gray, I use. Laura, how are you today this morning? Hi, hi, hi. I'm good. Um, I didn't so call you back, so that has nothing to do with you, so don't take it personally. Ask Karen. Karen, do I call you back? No. So <laughs> don't take that personally, and I'll call you later because Angelie will tell me to. How are you this morning? Okay, I'm fine. 
I, you know, it's so interesting though, like listening to you talk about intuitive eating, because I had been, prior to finding this group, I had been familiar with intuitive eating, so many different things, but I had never really considered or thought of myself as an addict. Truly not, right? I literally found you guys through um, one of the Facebook groups and you were on, and it was fascinating. It blew my mind to think about addiction, right? When it comes to food, I think about drugs, I think about alcohol, but I never really thought about it with food ever. And it was the first time I never understood why other things didn't work for me. I never understood what it was about it. And it's that I can't do moderation. Like moderation is not an option for me. For other people, if it is, that's great. But for me and my brain, it's not. And it was the first time that it made sense to me. And to your point, what you've been talking about, if intuitive, my brain intuitively, like, yeah, my brain would do all kinds of crazy things intuitively. I mean, that model, the whole intuitive eating model for me does not work, period. And yet, at the same time, when you're doing those things, you don't realize that you have an addiction. You think there's, or at least I thought there was something wrong with me right. because I kept beating my head thinking, why can't I, you know, eat between these numbers or, you know, know intuitively when I'm full and then know to stop and be, you know, what comfortably full feels like and whatever didn't work yeah so I think it's so powerful for people to understand or at least for people like me to understand that there's a whole other model out there and the addiction model is a very different thing and it really works for the rest of us that we struggle and it also allows us to name it so we know that there's something that we can work on and again you know I said this yesterday but I can't fix a problem till I know what the problem is yeah so when you think that you can't do it because you're, you have no uh, willpower and, and you're lazy and you're stupid yeah. and you're duh, all the things that we tell ourselves. None of that is true. What's true is that you got this, this messed up wiring in your brain mm -hmm. that doesn't know what one is. Right. It just doesn't know. It doesn't work for you. So I just have to tell you, last night I went out with my husband to this amazing fish restaurant and they had these incredible cakes. So they've got carrot cake and carrot cake's my favorite, favorite cake. And Stephen is normal. He's a normal eater and he would discuss him whether he's having dessert and he said, no, he's full, but otherwise he'd have a slice of carrot cake. I said, you'd have a slice, I'd have the cake, okay? And you'd have it whether you were full or not. Right, and also it's got carrots in it, so obviously it's healthy, it's vegetables. okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's vegetable yeah. cake. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, but the thing that she said that was most important was that Stephen mm -hmm. said, if I wasn't full, I'd have a piece of cake. His intuitive eating isn't broken. His right. says, hey, I'm full, and you know what? There'll be carrot cake tomorrow, or next yes. week, or next year, and he don't ever have to think about it, mm -hmm. right? So when you don't have that, um, when you don't have that, that's when, hey, I'm full, and yeah, I'm going to have a uh, carrot cake and I'm going to bring a couple of slices home for the kids, right? So that you can eat it after everybody goes to right, sleep. Except, exactly. And that's the funny thing. That was a shift that I actually saw in myself because before I'd say, no, it's okay. I don't want it. And then I would go and do the secret eating. Of course. <laughs> right. Of course and this does. time it didn't trigger that thought. I mean, I still get those thoughts and I go, mm, that would be nice, but it's not that obsession or that compulsion that I have to go out and use over it. I'm able now just to have the thought and let the thought go. Right, mm -hmm. again, we can have feelings and they're not facts. Anything mm -hmm. else? I have a viewer question. So okay, sure. question. Um, Ida Thank says, you, Laura. Ida says, I'm so frustrated because I was looking for the dumping, so I'm assuming she had surgery. Okay. Um, I'm so frustrated because I was looking for the dumping to make me not want to eat something, but I have not gotten sick on anything. So I'm slowly finding myself slipping back to old habits. What can I do to stop myself? I would love to just say something. <laughs> Firstly, I've never dumped. Okay, I'm, po I'm, post I'm two years post bariatric surgery. I don't dump. I'm not a dumper. I couldn't throw up. I battled to throw up. I did try throwing up. I got really uncomfortable and get terrible reflux. But the thing is, if nothing changes, Thank you. It's not, not about the food. Everybody all you... together. It's not about the food. So my question is, Ida, why did you have the surgery? You know, I think that's a greater question that we have to ask ourselves is why do we put ourselves through a life risk? I mean, having surgery is major. It's not like you're going to have a tooth extracted. You're going under general anesthetic. 
It could be life-threatening for some people. It's not something you just do willy-nilly. There's a two-week recovery, some people longer, some people less, but it's a major, major event. It's not something you just go and go, oh, do you know what, I'll change my hair color today. And you guys, so does the surgery work in the beginning? For sure, because you can't, you, it's physically impossible, right? To eat the amount of calories that you ate before. So in the beginning, are you gonna lose weight, lose weight, lose weight? Of course you are. If this doesn't happen, if what's happening in your head doesn't change, then nothing's gonna change. And if it was just about the surgery, everybody who was overweight would have the surgery and everybody on the planet would be skinny. And every insurance would pay for that surgery so they didn't have to pay for the results of what obesity causes because it would be less expensive. And it's like my patients that come in that want me to write the prescription for the pill that if that pill worked, the person that invented that pill would have more money than God because everybody on the planet would take that pill. It ain't about the food. It's about what's happening in your head that's driving your behavior, <laughs> that's allowing you to do stuff that's hurting you. So the only surgery that would work would be brain surgery. That's true, <laughs> that's true. Maybe a frontal lobotomy, but I don't even think that works after time. Yes. So Ida, excuse me, says she had a surgery to get healthy and live longer. Of course, and that, like I said in the beginning, that's true, and that's what happens. So in the beginning, you're gonna lose the weight. And as you lose the weight, if you're a type two diabetic, your blood sugars are gonna get better. And you're going to be able to run around and breathe a little bit better, right? Because you're gonna shed the weight in the beginning. I can't tell you how many patients that I have, I'm a physician assistant, I can't tell you how many patients I have that come to my office, especially to the endo office, that have come back after they've gained, they lost 100 pounds and they gained back 130 and they don't know what happened. What happened is, again, they didn't realize that it wasn't just about not being able to eat in the beginning, that it's about what is driving our behavior. It's the behavior, it's the what's driving the behavior. It's not the food. You're picking up, which is a, 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 a bad, we think that that's the answer, but um, that's not the answer. So I, I just want to take you back a little bit in the movie, because I think as addicts, we need to play the movie out. So at the stage before I went in for surgery, I couldn't wipe my own ass, okay? I couldn't get out of bed because I couldn't wipe it because I was so big I couldn't reach it, okay? The other thing is I couldn't get out of bed because my hips and my knees were so sore. I couldn't walk around the grocery store because I was running out of breath. I couldn't breathe. I started looking at where would I be 20 years from now? Who would be taking care of me? Do I want to leave this for my kids to do? And not only that, do I want to feel so crappy about myself at every single day? I think when is this going to end and is this going to be over? So for me, if I keep playing the same movie over and over and keep doing the things that I was doing before, I'm going to land up exactly the same place as I was before. So it reaches a stage. At what stage does something shift? And the only person who really can make that shift is you because no one is going to follow you around and start slapping food out of your hand or telling you either you have to do this or begging you to do it because no matter what anyone says until you make a conscious decision and it comes with making a conscious decision to do something different, you are going to get exactly the same results as you had before. Again, because it's not about the food. It's about why are you picking up? You had a surgery and obviously, you're, I shouldn't say obviously, but sounds like you're still um, picking up food or eating stuff that you're not supposed to, right? We know we got to get abstinent from starches and sweets. End of the discussion. That's what triggers our dopamine receptor and part of what keeps us in active addiction. That's the physical part of it. So we know that we have to change that physical part. After or during, we have to change, we have to understand how we got there. How did, you, how did I weigh 90 pounds? How did you weigh 290 pounds? How did we get there? You know, why are we there? What's going on that allowed us to do the things that we were doing? Remember, okay. we're gonna talk about addiction. We're gonna talk about behavior that's hurting okay. us that we're doing anyway, that we know is detrimental to our health or to us spiritually. And we do it every day, day after day after day after day, and we feel ashamed and guilty and demoralized. And we do it anyway. It's what's in our heads, what's driving that. 
and spiritually, how do we get well? So you Did know, you want to talk to Denise? Yeah. Well, go ahead. She I'm doesn't know. <laughs> Speak. So I was trying to figure out from the last time I came and a couple of things that different people were saying about how do you pretty much get where you are. And um, it's, it's so many thoughts running through my mind. I remember a couple of meetings ago, somebody said, this guy was sitting here and he was like, well, I've been through this. I think he was, I don't remember if he was an alcoholic or whatever the okay. case was, but that didn't matter. He was like, when does it stop? And I think, like for me, when does it get to the point where I say, okay, I don't feel like I'm messing up anymore, or when does it change? So when we change spiritually, we change spiritually. Okay. So when we're learning to have acceptance, when we're learning to be honest, when we're learning to live with integrity, when we learn to be courageous, when we learn to do all of those stuff, all of those spiritual principles that we talk about, when we're learning to live that way, first of all, the, the compulsion, the, obsessive, the obsession and the compulsion goes away. That goes away, we get ourselves clean and that goes away. Do we still wanna use sometimes? Sure we do. But do we have that obsession and compulsion about it? No, we don't. Then, once you're changing spiritually, once you're learning and growing and learning how to take care of yourself spiritually, right? Once you're getting honest with yourself, um, this is uh, one of the, I don't know if you've spoken before actually. So, yeah, like okay, that. so not a whole lot, right? <laughs> so once you become part of, you know, it, it's about stepping into the solution. And the more you step into the solution, the less room there is for the problem. I, I hear you, but I still don't understand it. That's okay, but, You've not, you haven't done any, any of the work, okay. right? So we talk about willingness too, right? What are you willing to do to get well? What are you willing to do? By the way, do you do your gratitude list every day? I don't. Why? We're talking about taking 30 seconds out of your life to do something that was suggested what? to you by people who are in recovery. Okay, let me rephrase that. I won't say I don't because I don't write it down. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, 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 everything after but is bullshit. No, no, and... let me finish. Let me finish. Yes. There is not a day that I don't get up and I thank God for waking up and being in my right mind. Great. Why don't you write it down? Because you were asked to. Okay. You were asked to do a simple task. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. What are you willing to do? You're not willing to take 30 seconds to do what somebody suggested who is working on recovery. <clears throat> I would love to just say something else because this is like really sitting with me. So just coming back to Ida, okay? Mm -hmm. The thing is, we may change physically, but our brain doesn't change. It's not going to change overnight because we did something physical to ourselves. So our addiction talks to us in our own voice. It's been around for so long that it knows how to speak to us and it tells us stuff that we think intuitively is good ideas. So it comes up with all this stuff. And unless something really shifts in the way that we are thinking or doing something different or even being open to do something different because our best thinking and all those thoughts and all those decisions that we made up until this point brought us to here where we are right now. And for a lot of us, that's kept us in sick and miserable and really unhappy. So it really comes back to what Felice is busy saying. What are you willing to do or what are you willing to change? What are you willing to actually put in the time for to be able to shift how you're thinking or the way that you've been doing things to maybe try something on that's different? Because you have to try something that's different because your way doesn't work. It doesn't work or you wouldn't have needed the surgery and you wouldn't be having the challenges after the surgery. Your thinking got you exactly to where you are. So, so we learn to take suggestion from other people who have been there who have been sick and suffering and in active addiction, who aren't, who, who are still addicts because we're all addicts, right? But we're not sick and suffering. We're a lot more happy than we used to be. And taking suggestions from those um, who, just like we took suggestions from others, right? So that we could learn how to change. Okay, so I've got a couple of suggestions. And the suggestion is, firstly, if you're watching us on Facebook, because we live stream on different places, we have a closed group that's called What's Eating You? We post on that group our meeting IDs to be able to join us virtually in the room. My suggestion is step into a meeting. We have meetings twice a week on a Sunday from 9 to 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can join us in the room in Southeast Florida. It is free, okay? Um, the other gift is no matter where you are in the world, you can step into our virtual room. 
it feels like you're in the room we see you it is real time it feels like you are sitting here we can look into your eyes and not only that it gives you a voice because if we keep the same things in our head we stay in exactly the same place the other thing besides doing our gratitude list which we share with everyone you can either text it to a friend you can text it to us post it in what's eating you doesn't matter how you get it out get it out and the other thing that shifts my world besides working on my recovery which i do and it's not just talking about working on my recovery i actually work on my recovery i do workshops i do learnings i do things to work on my recovery i also am of service and service is a huge thing we are going to be posting different service opportunities because i was that neurotic obsessive compulsive that lived inside my head that was all about me and i needed to start shifting that paradigm and the easiest way to start doing it is to reach out to somebody else and do something for somebody else without expecting something in return and that is what service is about it's an expression of gratitude in a physical form yeah absolutely um so at least at least take the minimum suggestion because it's not about you know and angela says it all the time I, I, felicia was my sponsor and i used to think like wtf like why is this woman making me do this and she'd be pissed, pissed off while doing your gratitude list that's fine <laughs> but be pissed off all the time because day after day after day she had to do a gratitude list and she did i chose to do my gratitude list. well right to be my sponsee right that that was one of the things right, right? so yes and you did choose to do it because you wanted to get better right, right? so she had the willingness because she didn't want to stay sick and suffering. Right. I didn't understand why I was doing it. I didn't understand what it was going to do for me. I thought it was actually, quite frankly, stupid. I didn't think like writing down what I was thankful for was going to change my life, and it did. Yeah. So the challenge is 30-day challenge to everybody out there. Write three things you're grateful for, your strengths for the day, every single day for 30 days. And also, Felice said she'd be sharing something on acceptance. Yeah, with the I'll group. do that today. Actually. That's a gift to you this week. Yeah, um, and actually, it's from the big book of AA. So, and I'm going to read the promises, which I'd love to share with you guys because um, they're amazing and they come true. And the first thing that it says in the promise, and this is from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, if we are painstaking, painstaking, what am I willing to do? If we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that the universe does do for us what we can't do for ourselves. Are these extravagant promises? We don't think so. They're being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly and sometimes slowly, but they do always materialize if we work if we work for them. I'm blessed and grateful to be in recovery. I'm Dr. Oh, you mean at this place on Thursday? Yes. <laughs> so we all went down there. <laughs> so oh. 